long book, but we are going to be studying for the next month the Old Testament book of Habakkuk. If you have a paper Bible, you might want to look in the index. (laughs) Blessed are you if you're next to somebody who knows where that is. If you have a digital copy of the scriptures, open to the book of Habakkuk. Trusting God in uncertain times. Now I'm going to tell you that if you only hear this one message, you're going to miss what's going to happen in the heart of this wonderful Old Testament prophet. I I taught this years ago and one of the ladies, it was at a church in Porterville, I pastored in Porterville for about a year, and as I was teaching Habakkuk, she came up to me after the service and she, she was, in a nice way, she was joking about it a little bit, but she said, uh, I'll sure be glad when you get out of Habakkuk, because it's kind of heavy, and uh, she appreciated God's word, but I'm going to just you know, tell you right off the bat. This is not a feel-good book, but it ends well. Have you ever watched a movie that did not end well? You spend two hours watching something only to go, what? (laughs) Really? Well, this book ends well, but you're going to have to hear all four messages. Now, I don't think there's anybody here this morning that would argue with the fact that we are living in very uncertain times. The world has just gone crazy. Moral decay is just rampant. And it's seen in every form. This month, perversion will parade on city streets under the banner of pride. And it's being so widely accepted. And then in a very subtle way, we were coming to, to, to Grace here, I don't know, a week ago. And we, we passed by... Uh, this, this big pile of dirt, and it was surrounded by a portable fence with a locked gate. Somebody stealing dirt. That's, that's how, you know that's the reason they put the fence around it. Who's stealing? Corruption is so prevalent that we have to lock up our dirt. And I'm thinking about that pile of rocks out there we just paid good money for. We may be putting a fence around it. I don't know. But just, we're living in a time, folks, that so closely resembles the day of Habakkuk. We are going to see in the coming weeks just how relevant this book is, though it's about 2,600 year old. This prophecy, 2,600 years ago, now let me just give you some background and some context. The prophet Habakkuk, or Habakkuk, I've heard it pronounced that way. They were wrong. Habakkuk is right. That's the way I'm going to pronounce it. He prophesied during the final days of the Assyrian Empire. He prophesied primarily to Judah. Judah and Benjamin constituted the two southern tribes of Israel. They had gone through a civil war years before. Ten tribes to the north, known as Israel. Two tribes to the south, then became known as Judah. The kingdom of, of, of Israel split after the death of David's son, Solomon. And, it's, and it, it just went down from there. He is prophesying just in the final days of the Syrian Empire and right at the beginning of the Babylonian Empire who was under rulership by Nebuchadnezzar and his son Nebuchadnezzar. When Nebuchadnezzar ascended to power in 626 B.C., he immediately began to increase his influence to the north and to the west, towards the Mediterranean, towards Israel. Under the leadership of his son, Nebuchadnezzar, who was a fierce warrior, the Babylon army then comes in, overthrows Nineveh in 612 B.C., 
at forcing the Assyrian nobility to begin to take refuge. The Assyrians have been large and in charge. They were the ones who conquered the ten tribes to the north years before Babylon. Now their day is almost over because now Babylon is coming in and the Assyrians are dispersing and they're running, taking refuge. And there was an Egyptian king at that time, King Necho, who tried to help the Assyrian king flee. He met opposition from King Josiah, who was the king of Judah at the time, and arguably perhaps the most godly king Judah, the two southern tribes, had ever had. Remarkable man of God. Josiah opposes King Necho, Pharaoh Necho of, of, uh, of Egypt while he's trying to help the Assyrian nobility. He goes against them. Unfortunately, what happens in, in the battle, Josiah loses his life. He dies. Unfortunately, the one who followed him, one of his sons, Jehoiakim, was nothing like his father. That's the one who took over Judah after the death of the godly man Josiah. It says this about him in 2 Kings 23, 37. That is, it says this about Jehoiakim, that he did evil in the sight of the Lord according to all that his fathers, not his father, but his father, speaking of the, the descendants prior to Josiah. He did evil. And it says this, and I want you to see this, because this is when all this is happening. Jehoiakim comes into rulership, 2 Kings 24, verse 1, in his days Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up and Jehoiakim became his vassal for three years. In other words, he's a puppet king. He doesn't do anything if Nebuchadnezzar doesn't give him the green light. Then he turned and rebels against Nebuchadnezzar and the Lord then sends against Jehoiakim Raiding bands of Chaldeans, bands of Syrians, bands of Moabites, and bands of the people of Amnon. And sent them against Judah to destroy it. According to the word of the Lord which he had spoken by his servants, the prophets. What that verse is indicating is the very thing that Habakkuk is looking towards. It hasn't happened in Habakkuk yet, but it's about to. Habakkuk, Zephaniah, and even the prophet Jeremiah were some of those servants, the prophets that he mentioned in verse 2. These guys were contemporaries of one another. God sent them Jeremiah, Zephaniah, Habakkuk, and maybe a few others. To warn Judah consistently, if you don't turn away and come back to me, this is what I'm going to do. Now, Habakkuk had been around during the reign of Josiah. He knew Josiah. He remembered the spiritual reforms that Josiah had brought. He began, Josiah began reigning when he was eight years old. And the Bible says that he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, and he turned neither to the right or to the left. This was a godly man, and Habakkuk remembers that. But unfortunately, Jehoiakim, Josiah's son, proved to be more like their grandfather Ammon and great-grandfather Manasseh, doing evil in God's sight. Upon Josiah's death, the nation quickly reverted back to its evil Ways And this caused Habakkuk to begin questioning God's silence and apparent lack of action to purge his covenant people. He's become discouraged somewhat. Habakkuk is the last prophet sent to Judah before being carried away to Babylon in captivity. This is the last guy standing 
to warn Judah and Israel to come back to God. Now, I don't need to convince anybody here. Habakkuk's faith, as he watched what's happening to his nation, his faith was severely challenged. Do I have to convince you that life is never a bed of roses? Right? Particularly the Christian life. Man is born unto trouble just as surely as the sparks from a fire float upward. That's what Job said. It's inevitable. Life, I saw a bumper sticker one time said, Life is hard, then you die. <laughs> well, yeah, but he's a joy to be around. <laughs> but listen, even though, even, even though we live a life of faith, even though our faith is very personally and very explicitly placed in the person of Jesus Christ, and even though Christ is all in all, and even though He is sufficient to every need, and even though He's our hope and life and death, the Christian life is never just comfortable, right? There's always... Things that challenge our faith, that discourage us and pull us away from God. There's always problems in the Christian life. And folks, there was always problems in the life of the Israelites. Whether it was the Israels to the north or Judah to the south, Israel in general. There was always problems. And there were these problems that are arising, in, as we will see, in the mind of Habakkuk. As he wrote this prophecy. Now you and I know the, the reason there are so many problems is because there is always an active adversary. Right? Satan. He, he, he desires to tempt us to sin. He de desires to discourage us and <clears throat> cause us to lose hope. He presents temptations to our minds. He desires these things to undermine our faith. He wants us to doubt God and His goodness. He wants us to doubt God's love. He wants us to doubt that God cares. He wants us to doubt that God is able. That maybe things have gotten so out of control that even God's lost his ability to turn the tide on the evil. Temptations that tend to make us doubt God and wonder if we're really saved. Wonder if God really cares. Wonder if the faith that we hold on to so strongly could really have a failing or a weak link in it. He wants all of these things to jumble our mind. And folks, he wants to, to make Christianity and our faith look absolutely ridiculous. He, he, wants, he wants the outside world to think how foolish we are to be in this building on a beautiful Sunday morning talking about God. Boy, those Christians are stupid. Look what they believe he wants to do that. He wants to make Christianity look you know, ridiculous to the lost world. And folks, he's been doing it all through history. That's one of his main ploys. And one of the main anxieties that's pushed off on the world by Satan is what I would call just the, the problem of, of past events. Look, look, look at all the bad that has happened and that is happening now. And, and, and the world goes, how can a God like the one you claim in the Bible let the world get into the mess that it's in? Or for that matter, how, how can the God you claim is in the Bible let the, let the church get in the mess that it's in? And the church is in a mess, folks. Generally speaking, Jesus' church is, is, is a mess. But it's always had problems, right, from its very inception. You can go back to the book of Acts chapter 5 and find Ananias and Sapphira lying to the Holy Spirit, and they drop dead on the spot. There have been problems in the church since birthday at Pentecost. And... People look at it today, they look at the world and they go, how can God let the world get in this kind of condition? I thought he was God. How can he allow airplanes to fly into two twin towers? How can he do that? If he's really God, couldn't he have stopped that? Could he have stopped my mom, my dad from dying of cancer? Couldn't he have prevented me from losing my job? 
And on the list goes. And, and, and as Christians, we look at his church and we, 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 we see things on the television. These people that have so much money, they can broadcast such ridiculous concepts of God naming it and claiming and telling God what to do and prosperity, gospel, and all that stuff. Satan has deceived people. You look around the world, the world's in a mess. War, famine, disease, suffering, sorrow, death. Constant problems around the world. And you look at the church, then it too is in in a mess. There's apostasy, there's liberalism, there's a denial of the authenticity of the scriptures, a a denial of the verbal, complete inspiration of the Bible we love, a denial of the deity of Jesus Christ in the church. And and then they substitute every hellish philosophy of imaginable. Many pulpits today are just spewing out man's philosophy, not giving the word of God. Oh God, let that never happen here at Grace. You see, the issue today is if God is really God, why is everything in a terrible state? And it is. It's a mess. Why is God allowing it? Why are we having to cope with it? This is the great problem that's thrown up in the face of of Christianity today is the problem of past events. People look back and they go, what, if God is God, why? You know, and, and they look at that. And, and listen, people who have no faith in the God of the Bible find it very difficult to accept the God of the Bible in view of the history, of the past. They look at that and they go, "What? you guys are crazy. The, the You worship this God, the one who lets this kind of thing happen? Look at him, read your Bible. He's a God who's vindictive, he's mean, kills people, genocidal. They don't know God. They don't know know the story. Folk, devastating world problems become very difficult to reconcile with a loving, caring, kind God. It's the one that's presented in the Bible. But listen, let me tell you this, folks. There is absolutely... No excuse for confusion on the part of Christians. There's absolutely no excuse for rejection on the part of non-Christians. Because, the, listen, the plain teaching of the Bible sets it all straight. You see, some people think that the Bible is simply a textbook on salvation. And I'll grant you, the theme of the Bible, if you could say there is a, the central theme of the Bible is redemption. God's redeeming His creation. He's redeeming humanity. That's the central theme. But you know, as well as I do, that that's just one of the threads that runs through the theme of of the Bible. The Bible's purpose reveals the entire destiny of the world. It's more than just a book on how to be saved and the need to be saved. The Bible clearly reveals what's going to happen to this world. If all the Bible cared about was salvation, it wouldn't need to deal with the fall of man. It wouldn't need to deal with hell. It wouldn't need to deal with all the things that have to do with a godless world. But the Bible, look, it's infinitely more than just a textbook on salvation, right? It is that, but it's more than that. The Word of God in total revelation is concerned with the entire world, its condition, with its destiny. The Bible has very profound philosophy of history and a very distinctive worldview. And Christians, that's why we need to read our Bibles. We need to develop a biblical worldview We need to view the chaos and the commotion and the corruption that's going on now in light of what God's Word says and how we're to live in those days. Let your light so shine, Jesus said. And Peter said, we're to live as lights that shine forth in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. It should change the way we view the world. That's why I say there's no excuse on on our part as believers for any confusion about what's going on in the world. Yes, it is bad, but we have a God who's large and in charge and still on a throne. And things are happening just the way he says they're going to happen. Listen, you read the Bible, you study it carefully, it's going to show you (laughs) how how to view these kinds of things. If your habit is simply to, you know, open your Bible and pursue peruse your favorite psalm or read over and over again the the Sermon on the Mount, 
uh, and just flip around to your favorite gospel, you're, you're not going to get any of that. If all you're doing is picking and choosing, but if you want to read the whole counsel of God, you see what he's doing, what he's done, how it fits into his purpose. That's what you need. You need to carefully study it. You're going to find this when you study the Word of God. Everything that occurs in history has a place in God's divine plan. He is absolutely in sovereign control of everything. The Word of God then is concerned with the whole spectrum of the world and its destiny. Now I say all of this to say this. Habakkuk is an illustration of of, of this problem because the prophet kind of treats the problem of past events and present circumstances and he treats it from the perplexity of his own life. When I, when I first read Habakkuk and began to kind of think about what he's going through, I said, man, I can relate so much to him because I, I speak the word of God and, 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 and it challenges me to keep my focus where it needs to be. And he's perplexed and I've been that way. And, and Satan tempts us to get that way. Every Tuesday morning at six o'clock, me and the elders and, and one other gentleman meet. There's, there's usually five of us. We meet in my office for prayer. And we pray for you we pray for God to do work here, but we go all around the world. We, we pray for our, our nation. We pray for our governor. We pray for our, our, our president. Now listen, God didn't call us to criticize them. He called us to pray for those in authority over us. And so we pray. Nothing has changed. And so we keep praying, right? Habakkuk... In essence, he, he just, he, he, God, I can't figure out why it's going this way. If you're who you are, then why? That's his problem. He's just like us. He's troubled by what he's seeing in his world. It's grieving him. And, it, and he's crying out to God. Now, in Habakkuk's day, Judah, Israel was backslidden, which is, of course, nothing new for Israel. Israel had turned away from God. They'd forgotten God. Israel was completely given over to idolatry. And so he begins in verse 2 with the real cry of his heart. If you've got your Bibles open, verse 2, hear, hear a little bit of his frustration. I don't have to read this into the text. It's there. Oh, Lord, how long shall I cry and you won't hear? Even cry to you, violence, and you will not save. Why do you show me iniquity? Why do you help me? I, I, I got a, an understanding of our world events. Why do you show me iniquity and cause me to see trouble? For plundering and violence are before me. There's strife, there's contention arising. Therefore, the law is powerless. And justice never goes forth, God. For the wicked surround the righteous, therefore perverse judgment proceeds. Sounds like it was written about America. Told you this is relevant for being 2,600 years old. It's relevant. Habakkuk is praying, God, our nation is in a mess. I've been asking you and asking you and crying out for you to change it. Why don't you do something about it? How long? So I cry out and you won't hear. Sounds familiar. The situation in Israel sounds familiar. Sin, immorality, vice, they were rampant. Those in the government were indolent, lacked integrity. Those who applied the law applied it dishonestly. Justice is nowhere to be found. Habakkuk, a man of God, has had his heart burdened before God as to why God are you allowing this? Such were the conditions of Israel, or specifically here, Judah. And folks, the same is true today. As we look at our world, we see the same characteristics exactly as Habakkuk's day. In verse 2, there's violence. Certainly that is fitting for our day. Verse 3, there's iniquity. And then he mentions violence again. 
There's violence and there are those who raise up strife and contention. There are revolutionaries stirring up trouble. There's wars, there's rumors of wars. There's always some hot spot, always something happening. And then verse 4, therefore the law is slack. There's no justice fairly and honestly. Law and authority are not dealing fairly and honestly, and it's difficult to find justice in this world, just as it was in the day of Habakkuk. By the way, Solomon was right when he said in Ecclesiastes, look at this verse, that which has been is what will be. That which is done is what will be done. And there's nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which it may be said, see, this is new. Ah, It's already been done in ancient times before us. Folks, the world has always been a mess. It started with the fall of man in the Garden of Eden. You don't get more than a page or two from the fall and you got your first murder, violence. People making excuses. And it just snowballs from there, if you will. Like many of us, Habakkuk's perplexed by the situation and he cries out to God and says, God, if, if you are who you are, why are you letting it happen? And we stand here today, 2,600 years later in the 21st century, and we look to God with the same question, God, why is it like this? Why is it we are constantly crying out about these things and nothing seems to happen? It just seems like things keep getting progressively worse. And folks, if you think the situation was bad then, and you think it's bad now, this isn't going to encourage you. It's actually going to get worse. Okay? Read your Bible. In the last days, perilous times will come, Paul told Timothy. Perilous times will come. Are we in the last days? There's no question we are. If you think God's inactivity is perplexing, it does seem like he's not doing what you're asking him to do, just notice his activity. Now listen, Habakkuk is perplexed in verses 2 through 4, but it's nothing compared to what he's going to discover when he hears God's answer. You want God to answer? Okay. Verse 5, here's God. How long will I be crying out to you, Lord? When are you going to think about this injustice, this violence, and all the corruption and everything like that? Okay, Habakkuk, verse 5, look among the nations and watch. Be utterly astounded, Habakkuk, for I will work a work in your day, not someday, but in your day, which you would not believe, though it were told you. Folks, God doesn't say, I'm going I'm to answer your prayer, Habakkuk, and everything's going to be fine. It's going to be roses. No, he says, be utterly astounded. You're going to be blown away. For I'm going to work a work in your days which you would not believe even if you, they, it was told to you. And here's God's answer. All right, you ready for this, Habakkuk? You're not going to like it, Habakkuk. For indeed, I'm raising up the Chaldeans. That's just another term for the Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, that whole regime. I'm raising up the Chaldeans. They're a bitter And a hasty nation which marches through the breadth of the earth to possess dwelling places that are not theirs. They are terrible. They are dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity proceed from themselves. Their horses also are swifter than leopards and more fierce than evening wolves. Their chargers charge ahead. Their cavalry comes from afar. They fly as the eagle that hastens to eat. They all come for violence. You think violence is existing now? Just wait. Their faces are set like the east wind. They gather captives like sand. Their faces are set like the east wind. It means they are set forward. It's like they, they are on a determined path. Nothing is going to distract them or detract from what their goal is and that is to take people captive and he says their captives are going to be like sand in other words innumerable they're going to come in they're going to empty out the land this is not what Habakkuk's been praying for right this is not exactly what he was looking for they're going to take this whole nation Habakkuk they're going to clean out the land 
They scoff. Look at verse 10, continuing to describe the Chaldeans, Nebuchadnezzar and his band of warriors. They scoff at kings, and princes are scorned by them. They could care less about who the political leader is of the nation they're in. They're going to conquer you. We don't care how big or bad you think you are. They scoff at them. They deride every stronghold. There's no city with enough wall to stop them. They deride every stronghold, for they heap up earth and mounds, and they seize it. Then his mind changes, and he transgresses, and he commits offense, ascribing this power to his God. He thinks he's doing this all on his own, by his own power. But I am the one who's raising up the bitter and hasty Chaldeans. Boy, that, that's a hard pill to swallow when you consider the kind of man Nebuchadnezzar was and his son Nebuchadnezzar was and the violent warriors of the Babylonian army that took over the mighty Assyrians. They are something to behold and they were raised up by God. And you go, wow, God, that's not exactly what I was hoping would happen. But God is basically telling Habakkuk this, listen, you're crying out to me and you think things are bad in Judah now? You haven't seen anything yet. He's been crying, oh God, deliver us. Deliver us. God says, not only will I not deliver you, it's going to get worse than it is now. God intends to raise up the utterly pagan, godless people to come in and destroy Judah, to take them captive. This is the problem of Habakkuk, folks. Why is God inactive? That's what it starts with. Why? How long, O oh Lord? How long? You're not doing anything. Why does God not hear my cry? And then his problem accentuates to this when he does answer. Why do you answer that way? <laughs> why that? Now, we've just looked at 11 verses, and we learned something about God's ways. Number one, God's ways are typically mysterious. Wouldn't you agree with that? That's not a revelation. Yeah, God's ways are often beyond our ability to comprehend. Isaiah said, wrote this about, God said this in Isaiah, I should say, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways your ways, or your ways are my ways. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, my thoughts than your thoughts. In other words, God says, you can't grasp my thoughts. You don't know what I'm doing. You don't know my ways entirely. So yeah, God's ways are, are mysterious in, in, in at least two different arenas they're mysterious. His, act, his inaction is mysterious. It is strange how that God is silent in very serious circumstances. And we ask ourselves, well, why did God let Israel get this far gone? Why didn't God smash those idols right when they were put up? Why did God allow the false prophets to come in and mislead so many people? Why didn't he strike them down on the spot? Why did God allow Israel and Judah to, to, to deteriorate at all? Why didn't God maintain the purity of Israel? We could ask the same thing about his church, right? Why, why has God let liberalism come into the church I spoke with a lady recently who, who, attends a, who attends a church, and she just confided to me. She said, yeah, our church right now is pulling away from the denomination. She used a particular word. I can't remember what it was, but we're disassociating with our and becoming independent because they've gone so liberal. And I said, you're doing a good thing. You need to separate from that kind of liberalism. Why does God allow his church to get into this kind of condition? Why, doesn't he, why does he allow the, the, the prosperity gospelers to continue to have airtime and, 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 and trap so many people? Why does God allow so many wrongs to be done? Why in the context of the church does God allow people under the name of Jesus Christ to commit the atrocities that have been committed? All of these things come into our mind as we look at the condition of our world. There's so many churches that name the name of Jesus Christ and and under the name of Jesus Christ, we're doing some unbelievable things. Just greedy. And, and people are blindly following that stuff. Have some discernment, church. Right? Have some discernment. 
I mean, if God is really God, why doesn't he keep the church pure? Why does he let all that happen? And on and on we could go. How long have we been praying for revival in America? How long have we been praying for revival all around the world? We pray for that just about every Tuesday. And men, by the way, you're invited. Get yourself up about 5.30, put on your makeup. <laughs> Get down here and pray with the elders and myself. Let's pray for our nation. Let's pray for our church. We've been praying for this, but I don't see any revival yet. But we're going to keep praying for that. Why didn't God take these people who've turned against him and turn them towards him? Isn't, doesn't the Bible say that the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord and he turns it wherever he wants it to? Like a channel of water, he directs it. God can change a king's heart. I don't need to show you the illustration, but the very guy, Nebuchadnezzar, that's going to attack them, later he's going to meet a young man named Daniel. And Nebuchadnezzar is going to have a change of heart. The very guy that he's bringing against Judah someday is going to come, I believe, to a genuine knowledge of the God of all creation. Keep praying. The king's heart can be changed. Keep praying for our president. Keep praying for your governor. Keep praying for people in, the, in, in high authority in our land. God can do something. We've been praying for it. God is going to do something. I know it gets frustrating. Why is God silent in the midst of all the atrocities committed in his name in the church? And why does he allow the world to go on like it's going if he's really God? God's ways are mysterious. And folks, his inaction, just his seeming, his seeming inaction. I don't believe God is ever inactive. He's always doing something. We, we, we just don't see it. We, it registers with us as inaction. But I'm going to tell you something else. His actions are mysterious. Yeah, his inaction may kind of baffle us a little bit. But his action, when he does act, it can be mysterious too. We discover from Habakkuk that God sometimes gives a very unexpected answer to our prayers. For a long time, God didn't seem to answer. Then all of a sudden, God answered. Now, in Habakkuk's mind, he's like us. God probably has been answering all along, but he really wasn't answering the way Habakkuk wanted him to. And finally God answered, and it was even more mysterious than before he was answered because Habakkuk thought he knew what Israel needed. I'm praying for revival in America. I'm praying for God to turn things around, to restore us, to heal our land, and all of these things. You see, God says, look, I'm going to do things a certain way. I know what you're praying for, Frank. You're praying for healing in your land. Habakkuk, I know what you're praying for. You want to, you want to see the revival happen. Just Habakkuk think, is thinking, Lord, I, I, I keep crying out to you and crying out for your nation. God, bring us back. Look, I, we just need a revival, God. What you need to do, Lord, is just sort of punish them a little bit, have a revival, turn them around, and make them turn towards you, God, and everything will be hunky-dory. You ever use that term? That's kind of outdated. I just dated myself, huh? I would never use that term. Habakkuk thinks he knows what's best for Israel, just like Frank does. Lord, what we need in America today is a genuine revival. We need healing in our land. We need all this, God. Uh, at least that's what I think. And Habakkuk thinks he knows what's best for Israel, what's best for Judah. They just need a good whipping. God, they just need to be punished a little bit. Then they need a great revival. God, they'll turn to you, and everything will be great, right? John Newton, you know the man who wrote Amazing Grace? As he grew in a, as a Christian, became a pastor, he felt that he wanted something better in his spiritual life. He tells this in one book about him. He said he, he wanted something to deepen his spiritual life, so he cried out to God for a deeper knowledge of God. He wanted his own spiritual understanding to be better. and He wanted a new dimension in his Christian experience, as he explained it. You know what God did? Well, God, he, John Newton expected some wonderful vision of God. He expected some dramatic blessing from heaven. What he got was, for the next several months, God seemed a million miles away. 
And God seemed to abandon John Newton to Satan himself. He was tempted. He was tried beyond his comprehension. The exact opposite of what he prayed for. But you see, God had allowed Newton to go into the depths of suffering and hardship to teach him to depend entirely on him. And when Newton had learned his lesson, he brought him out and blessed him. I don't think you're any different than I, do, I am. I don't think you have ever prayed and said, God, allow me to suffer. No. God bless me. Help me lead, guide, direct, and protect. I, I don't want to pray for suffering, do you? Israel's about to suffer. Habakkuk knows that Judah and Israel, they're about to suffer. So let me just ask you a big question. What is that big question? Okay, we've gone through this, and now you're going, right now you're thinking, oh, I can't believe I came to church today. It's beautiful. This has been depressing. But let's, let's just ask, so what? So God's ways are mysterious. His, his inactivity is mysterious, but his activity can also be very mysterious. Here's the basic biblical principle that I want you to, to leave with today. Okay, suffering always precedes glory. Now, that is a biblical principle, but it is a life general principle. Uh, we see it in our Lord. Hebrews 2.9, but we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. There's, there's the principle of hardship, suffering, difficulty that has to happen before the good can come, before the glory, if you will. Nobody's ever attained anything in life, but what he first didn't sacrifice, suffer sacrificially for hours to get there. Do you want to be the best at your vocation? It takes hours and hours and hours of repetitive things for you to become that top quality mechanic, industrial engineer, whatever. You have to sacrifice hard hours to get that education. The suffering comes before the glory, right? You watch these well-trained athletes who they get on the, the, the field of play and they're remarkable in what they can do and how they can run and how they can catch. What you and I don't see was how much time and sweat and pain they went to without the cameras on them to get to be as good as they are. And they're remarkable in what their bodies are capable of doing. But that didn't happen, I guarantee you, without doing more than three push-ups, right? You want to excel. You want to, you want to, you want to be that, that best. It's going to, it, the principle is, is suffering, hardship always precedes that. It just, that's just the way, it, it's throughout the scripture. We could spend time just looking at that principle, but you know that's true. Uh, someday... Someday, Israel, according to pr prophecy, Israel is going to be glorified. They're going to be what God wanted them to be all along. Someday, they're going to reign with Christ, who is their Messiah. But right now, it's not happening. And it's, it, listen, it's, it's going to happen, but it's not going to happen without a great deal of suffering for Israel. And I say that even today. Here's, here's an interesting thing to consider. They are about to go into captivity. That's going to happen. Nebuchadnezzar is going to come. If you've read your Bible, you know this happens. They go away. They're in captivity. Seventy years. They come out of captivity. And do you know that to this day, Israel, as a nation, as a whole, has never gone, I'm going to use the biblical term, forgive me, whoring after other gods. You ever heard the term, that broken from sucking eggs? 
Yeah, some of you older folks have heard that. Yeah, the hardship they're going to go through is horrible. But God will bring them out of that 70 years and they will be a different nation. While they were in captivity, scholars tell us it was there that their leaders got serious about canonizing what we now call the Old Testament. Remarkable what suffering did for them. And someday, they've, because they've rejected their Messiah, they're going to go through a hardship again. That's what the book of Revelation largely deals with. But they're going to come out, and, and the Bible says that there will be a remnant saved, and God will bless them and glorify them as His people. He will keep His covenant promises to them, but it's not going to happen without the suffering first, right? Folks, someday, the church of Jesus Christ is going to be glorified. We're going to be everything God wants us to be. And in that day that we meet Jesus Christ in our glorified bodies, it's going to be awesome. But before that happens, we're going to go through some hardship. We may go through persecution as a as church. Yeah, that's part of it. But we're also going to go through hardships, through health issues, financial issues. Because the Christian life is not a bed of roses. It, it's, it's, it's hard. A life of faith is tough. Well, I like what Paul said. I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that will be revealed in us. The suffering right now pay, will pale in comparison someday. The hardship you're going through, the hardships of, of, of losing loved ones, of losing jobs, of whatever, the hardships that you and I endure right now will pale. They will absolutely vanish in comparison with the glory that someday is going to be revealed in us. That's the wonderful news. Now, Habakkuk had this idea of what he wanted to happen. God chasing Judah, yeah, chasing him, bring him back, turn him back. Just like in the days of Josiah, you did it before. You, you brought a sweeping revival and a restoration of Israel through a godly king, Josiah. He knew Josiah. He was part of that. And he's basically saying, let's, hey, let's, let's go back to the golden era. How many of you have ever said, man, remember the good old days? Yeah, we always think that it was better then. Can I just say to you, you're living in the good new days. Because the circumstance in this world doesn't change who I am in Jesus, right? Now Habakkuk had an idea of what he wanted. He, he wanted it to be like the days of Josiah where these great reforms just swept the nation. The word, the law was read and people's lives were changed. The idols were broken down and scattered into the dust. He wanted that. He wants, another, he wants another Josiah. You know what the Bible says about Josiah? Look at 2 Chronicles 34, 1 and 2. Josiah was eight years old when he became king, and he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. He did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. He walked in the ways of his father David, and he did not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. That is said about very few kings in Judah. And I don't believe there's a single king in the ten northern tribes that was ever said about there was a, a small remnant of kings. You had kings like Asa, Jehoshaphat, who were men of God who did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. You had men like Hezekiah who did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. But unique to Josiah, he did not turn from the right or to the left. He actually expands on saying how good he was. And listen, the kind of man he was when he became a king... That's what the Bible says about the reign of Josiah. I want you to see what the Bible says about the death of this godly man. Look at 2 Chronicles 35. Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah, also lamented for Josiah. This was the man of the hour. This was the kind of president you want, where when he dies, you weep. He lamented for Josiah, and to this day, all the singing men and the singing women speak of Josiah in their lamentations. They made it a custom in Israel, and indeed they are written in the, lament, in, in the laments. Now, 
the rest of the acts of Josiah and his goodness. According to what was written in the law of the Lord. In other words, his goodness was based on what God's word said. This man lived out his faith. And all of his deeds from first to last. Indeed, they are written in the books of the kings of Israel and Judah. You, you, see, you see why Habakkuk wants to go back to the good old days? Why he's praying for... You remember how it was, God? Why, how long am I going to keep crying out? Just go back and, and make it like it was. It was wonderful back then. And that's honestly, folks, when I think of revival, I'm, I'm thinking of, God, what you did in early America in the 1700s through George Whitfield and Jonathan Edwards and, and some of these great men of God and a fire that swept through the, the, the colonial America. We need that today. Oh, God, bring revival. And that's what Habakkuk wants God to restore the nation back to its good old days. He's like we are. We, he likes to prescribe the answers to his own prayers. Lord, just in case you're stuck for what to do, let me tell you what I think is best for the nation. All right? But we forget the fact that God sometimes makes things an awful lot worse before they get any better. Just remember that God may do the opposite of what we expect, folks. I once heard God's mysterious ways described like this. His ways, from our perspective, might look like the backside of a Persian rug. But from the other side, from God's perspective, it's a beautiful tapestry. You ever looked at the backside of a Persian rug? Teresa and I were given a Persian rug by some, some folks. They needed to get it out of their house because far too many cats had used it for a toilet. But it was a gorgeous rug. And so we brought it and put it in the, in the garage, laid it out. And I had a professional come by and he cleaned it as best he could. It was beyond hope. But I remember having it turned over as we were cleaning it and going, man, this is ugly. <laughs> this is just ugly. But you flip that thing back right side up and it was beautiful. It stunk like all oh, high heaven. This is nasty. But it was a gorgeous rug. God sees what he's doing and it's beautiful. We don't see that, do we? What we're seeing today in our late nation, folks, is the backside of God's design. What we're seeing in the world today is the suffering that the world is going to have to go through and get ready for the glory that someday going to be it. God, God is going to make this world what He wants to be. He will take back His creation that was lost at the fall. But it's going to get worse before it gets better. You know that someday this world is going to be in the hands of Jesus Christ personally. The lion will lay down with the lamb someday. Amen? Amen. The Bible says that a little child someday is going to play in a snake pit and never get bitten. My question is, God, why snakes? Even in heaven, really? I'm going to assume that I will feel differently then than I do now about snakes. But that's going to happen. A child will play in an adder's den and will never have fear of that snake. And folks, the nations are going to see Jesus Christ reigning on the throne of David and Israel is going to be glorified and the church is going to be glorified and Christ is going to be glorified. All of that's going to happen, but not before suffering, not before hardship. And folks, God is, right now, I believe, beating down this world in judgment until Christ comes. It's, it, that's why I say this is not the most encouraging message. You've got to stay through the end and watch what happens to Habakkuk. Because he changes. But that's for next week and the following weeks, okay? <laughs> what I want to say to you now as I, as I close and I know that this, is a, this was like not one of those feel-good messages. But it's a message that reminds us that God is in control. And he is going to have his way. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, if that is not where you're at in your life right now, you don't need to leave not knowing Jesus. You can today repent, turn from your sin and say, Jesus, come into my life. I want you to be Lord and King in my life. You can have that relationship. And for eternity, you're set. 
but you're going to suffer with us the hardships of life. I'm not promising you a bed of roses. I'm not promising all your troubles go away. No, a lot of times when you become a Christian, you get a big old target on your chest. So don't, don't make that decision lightly. But make that decision for Christ and come to Him and find out that He is sufficient. He is our hope in life and death and everything in between. He is our all in all. If you don't know Him today, we're going to dismiss with prayer and I'm going to remain up here. And I want to ask you, would you come and talk to me? Let me show you, lead you in a prayer to trust Christ as your Lord and Savior. Would you do that when we dismiss here in a few moments? If you want to do that, I'm available for you. I'm not going anywhere because lunch is waiting outside. <laughs> I'm willing to stay. If you're guests with us today, you are a special invite for you. There's plenty. We've got charcoals fired up by now. We have a baptism happening here shortly, and we want you to be a part of it. If you're visiting with us, give us a chance to kill you with kindness. Let us show you our hospitality. Don't just run off and get in your car and leave. Hang out. We're not bad people, so some of us aren't. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Teresa's wonderful. Teresa's wonderful. I've been blessed, so blessed. I'm in so much trouble. Pray for Frank. Okay. Why don't you stand? I want to dismiss us with prayer. I'm going to pray for the food in here. And that way we're free to start eating when everything is, is good to go. Okay? Thank you, Father. Thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, for this time of study. And Father, thank you for the truth that we see in the back of it. May it impact us and change us in the coming weeks as we consider what's going on in our world and how we can have a better view of how to endure hardship as a soldier of Jesus Christ. Lord, thank you for those who are guests with us today. We're so thankful you bring people through our doors. We want to make sure, Lord, that we treat them with Christian hospitality uh, and, Father, make them feel welcome. Lord, if there is one here, even one, that doesn't know Christ, then today we pray to be the day of their salvation when we come to Christ and be saved. Lord, bless our meal. Thank you for the food for those who prepare it. May Father, we bless it to the nourishment of our body, but also, Lord, bless our time of fellowshipping with one another. That is a biblical thing. And we are enjoying one another's company today. We ask it in Jesus' name.